So good morning, everyone. I'm Chrissy Butis. I'm the Chief Government Affairs Officer at NJBIA, and I am thrilled to have our special guest with us here today uh, to discuss the future of health coverage in New Jersey, uh, especially during these really critical times with COVID-19. And so we hope to talk about the dynamics of the healthcare delivery system, as well as how insurance coverage plays into this. I am joined by three special guests. Uh, Kathy Bennett, who is the president and CEO of NJHA, and previously Kathy served as the Commissioner of Health. I'm also joined by John Hoffman, who is the head of health policy and advocacy at Janssen US and has over 34 years of experience working um, with J&J. &J. And we're also joined by Alan Karp, who is the executive vice president of healthcare management and transformation at Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield. And so again, a wealth of knowledge on our panel discussion here today and hope to get started by just kicking off obviously with you know, the most pressing issue that the that our nation as well as the, the world is facing, which is COVID-19. And I know all three of you are right in the midst of dealing with this pandemic in your respective industries and collaborating as much as possible. So we know that COVID-19 has upended the health and safety of our state and well in ways that were really unthinkable a year ago. Who would have thought? And so we have seen shifts in, in work and, and consumer behaviors. So really what has been that impact on your respective industries coming from the provider community, insurance community, the pharmaceutical co uh, community, and have you seen improvements in, in efficiency for like treating patients such as telehealth and others? So I would love to maybe turn over to, to Kathy to kick us off. Good morning and thanks so much for having us join today, Chrissy, really happy to be here and Really happy to actually talk a little bit about this issue, which has been top of mind, particularly as we come through the Thanksgiving season. Um, we've heard an awful lot of recommendations coming from CDC, from you know the State Department of Health, as well as from NJHA and our partners at the Medical Society and New Jersey State Nurses Association about the importance of individuals, you know, in the communities doing what they can to help manage the spread of COVID by masking, by social distancing and by practicing appropriate hygiene for hands and respiratory. Um, this is so important because we take a look and see what's been happening within hospitals. If I take us way back to the spring, um, at the peak of our surge, we had 8,200 inpatient hospitalizations. We had about three quarters of those patients on ventilators and no one really knew much about this novel virus. And in a very short period of time, we have seen such tremendous advances that have happened in terms of therapeutics, in terms of you know, best practices for diagnosing and for treating, and for sharing of that information. At NJHA, we're hosting over 35 calls a week with you know, clinicians and interdisciplinary teams, pharmacists and lab leads, and they're all sharing the advances that we have made. And frankly, you know, I'm really proud of the work here in New Jersey because what we can see is that New Jersey doctors and New Jersey's hospitals work the playbook for the rest of the nation. Thank you, Kathy. John, I'd love to hear your perspective. Yeah, thanks also for being here. And, and um, it's really interesting from a pharmaceutical perspective, probably the biggest thing that we're dealing with is on a positive side is the speed and efficiency now with which things are getting uh, reviewed and approved by the FDA because of the criticality of the pandemic, but that's kind of a blessing and a curse because while it helps us get things done quickly, it's also eroded some public confidence in the process. Now, the fact that there was an election and it got somewhat politicized certainly contributes to that, but you know, the development and approval and distribution of vaccines is great, but it's only great if, if people have the confidence to take them. And so that's something we're, we've got a whole new focus on, which is education, awareness, and addressing that that apprehension um, and then the other side on the therapeutic side it's interesting because as everyone is scrambling to find something that can work to either mitigate or or minimize the symptoms I last I heard I think there are 478 drugs at the FDA that are asked to be studied as a therapeutic option well obviously the FDA doesn't have the bandwidth for that so now you have providers rightly so trying different things. So we've had to put in a whole set 
of pandemic response principles to say, how do we make sure there's enough product for our existing patients that are on the, its approved indications, yet still manage to get the therapeutic options to the places in, in most critical need. So uh, once again, two new challenges that we haven't had to deal with before, but uh, the, the partnership and collaboration between the pharmaceutical companies with the provider community and with the government you know, has been really good and, and encouraging. Great, thanks, John. And how about you, Alan? Yeah, um, so first of all, thank you for, for having me uh, today. I, I would first say on our employees, uh, we're one of the largest employers in New Jersey, and um, we've had approximately 98 to 99% of our employees working from home since March 16th. Uh, we have about 6,000 employees um, in the state, and we, uh, we had to make a number of changes to make that happen. First of all, uh, we, uh, we had to take into account the, the issues that, that families and, and, uh, and our employees had with work-life balance uh, because it was such a, a tumultuous time, particularly in the spring. Uh, but but I'm, I'm happy to say that we were able to, uh, to uh, ensure that they had the technology necessary to be able to do their jobs, um, that uh, we have been able to hit all of our metrics. Uh, we still have um, a significant portion of our employee base working from home with the exception of some essential employees like in IT and security that are in the office. And that led to uh, a uh, situation where we had to reconfigure our offices, uh, make sure we had appropriate social distancing. Uh, uh, we, we take temperatures um, of, of folks who are coming in as they enter the garage. And if, they're, uh, if they have a temperature, uh, we send them home. We, they fill out uh, forms in advance in case they've had contact with somebody who's had COVID. So it changed our whole process. Um, and, uh, and again, we, we've been able to adapt by leveraging technology like WebEx, WebEx Zoom, conference calls, et cetera. Um, so so uh, that's actually gone, gone fairly well, although again, it's a significant change. The other thing I would say that was critical for us as an employer is to continually communicate to our employees, um, not only what's going on in, in, with the pandemic and with our business, but also uh, a status of kind of where we stood relative to bringing the employees back. Um, again, we haven't done that. Probably is going to be into 2021 because safety, uh, the safety of our employees is critical and their ability to serve our members. Just quickly on the industry, um, we the, probably the biggest change we saw or one of the biggest changes we saw was the, was the usage of telehealth services. Um, when we were, uh, in, a, in, a, in a shutdown period in, in the spring, um, physicians who were under a fee-for-service payment system, meaning if they didn't see a patient, they didn't get paid, were really hurting. So we expanded our telehealth uh, and telemedicine coverage, and uh, we went from about 5% telehealth visits up to 60% in the middle of the, uh, in, in the, middle of the peak period. And um, that was a big uh, relief for a lot of our primary care physicians who were able to still see patients, uh, make sure they were okay, and, and, got, and uh, were able to make sure they got paid. Uh, the other thing is we, we waived co-pays and deductibles uh, for our members relative to COVID-related um, diagnoses. Uh, we advanced payments to primary care physicians um, because of, of, of what I, I just mentioned in terms of their, their uh, the fact that they, they don't have big balance sheets typically and, and uh, they were really struggling uh, to stay open. And, um, and then we also extended payments for employer groups, meaning, you know, we gave them um, uh, over a 12 to 18 month period the opportunity to, to pay over time uh, versus paying us during the, the, the heart of the crisis. So those are some of the things we, we have done. Um, the telehealth uh, or telemedicine piece has really stuck. Uh, we're, not, we're not at 60% anymore. We're down to like around 10, uh, but that's double uh, where, we, where we historically were. And that's because both physicians and, and members have now accepted that that's a, that's a really good way to seek care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I was just wondering, just to stay on the telehealth component, because I know it's such a, a, a big issue uh, in the healthcare delivery system. Kathy or John, do you have any, you know, comments on, you know, how how you have utilized telehealth? I know from obviously the employer community, it's certainly something, you know, we would we want offer to our respective employees who purchased their health insurance through their employer. Um, but love to hear how that might have changed the dynamic dynamic, not only in COVID, but moving forward from your respective uh, seats. 
So Kathy, I don't know if you had any, any thoughts on that. Um, sure. So telehealth, um, and I'll say, you know, we really saw it leapfrog um, in the, you know, from where we stood and what we've been fighting to get to over the past decade in terms of regulatory authorities and approvals. And I think what we saw with COVID is that it, it ushered in a, a new, you know, a new era of consumerism. Um, we've actually all given, I think, a lot of um, thought and a lot of consideration to what consumers want, how do they want care, where do they want to care, the timing of it. And, you know, one of the things that COVID, you know, introduced really quickly were decisions being made by the federal government and the state government that supported that delivery, whether it was telehealth, telemed, having your devices transporting back information that was critical to help manage care. And this became really important in particular because as an industry, we saw this during the spring surge and we're seeing it again at this point. You know, individuals are delaying care, not for COVID, but for all these other issues that are chronic uh, condition related or, or even more frightening an acute condition. So suffering symptoms of stroke, suffering heart, you know, heart attacks or, or symptoms of heart attack and not going to an emergency department. And they've had some precursors at least with the advent of telehealth and telemed for chronic conditions, for acute conditions, there's an ability to quickly connect with the provider and also be directed to the right side of care. Yeah, yeah Chris, I would build on, on what both Alan and, and Kathleen said in terms of, you know, in some ways COVID dragged our fragmented antiquated healthcare system kicking and screaming into the 21st century. And we wanna make sure that we keep the things whether it's telemedicine, whether it's uh, large, you know, 90-day, um, you know, uh, prescription refills, whether it's, you know, re reduced or eliminated copays, those kind of things. Because our concern and what we saw early on was for chronic patients, you know, a disruption in care. And obviously that has long-term consequences. So to the extent that telemedicine or waiving copays or getting them three months worth of uh, you know, drug supply is critical because if they stop their adherence to their medication, it will have long-term um, adverse clinical consequences. So, you know, how do we move that forward and strike the appropriate balance? I'm glad to hear Alan say that, you know, telemedicine, you know, has, has doubled, um, but maybe it should be even more, especially in certain specialties, obviously in oncology or rheumatology where there are infusions and things like that. You know they need to be you know seen by the physician but psychiatry primary care perhaps you know maybe those should be higher you know at a telemedicine level um and create more bandwidth in the system quite frankly especially as you see the demographics of our population age um you know we're going to need that bandwidth yep and john kathy mentioned that folks have been delaying care and such and you know the vaccine is going to be critical to the conversation moving forward and how it gets distributed i know that you all know that the state has a very robust plan it's actually on the department of health's website right now uh calling for at least 70 percent of our population to be uh to receive the vaccine in in the not too distant future when it becomes available and such the business community has a has a key role in this because as you said there's some hesitancy to possibly get vaccinated and such and you know we want our employees to be healthy we want the entire population to be healthy so we can get our economy back up and running to make sure that we also stop the spread of this global pandemic so so John, can you share with us a little bit about, you know, really what you're seeing now with that collaboration amongst the pharmaceutical companies and some of the clinical trial diversity that's gone into play and, you know, what message you would give to the business community about the vaccine? Um, and Kathy, um, I'd love to hear a little bit more on the distribution side uh, and, and the role of the healthcare community playing in getting the vaccine out and about as well. Yeah, so there's a couple things in, in your question. Let's talk about the confidence piece first. Um, you know, we have at, at, at J&J, we have an interesting challenge. We committed to the largest clinical trial for anything ever, 60,000 patients, and also within that, the appropriate diversity of, of groups to make sure that the vaccine works because, you know, people respond differently based on their culture, their DNA, et cetera. Well, that has become a challenge because there's not only the lack of, of confidence in the vaccine, but there's a 
stronger lack of confidence in participating in clinical trials. So unless we get enough people into the trial and get the approval, then we can't, you know, uh, be able to bring the, the vaccine to market. What's helped with that, at least I believe, is the fact that Pfizer and Moderna have come out with such high effectiveness rates. Hopefully that will go a long way towards building public confidence. Quite frankly, those are higher than than we had expected based on what we knew between the data sharing. And I think uh, I think if you ask Pfizer and Moderna, they would and, and they were candid, they would tell you the same thing, which is great. Um, and so, but the other thing is on the distribution and implementation side, you know, really complicated operation, um, work speed and general Perna have done a great job of figuring out the role of DOD uh, and, you know, um, you know, FDA and all the, all the, and NIH that all have to be involved. But at the state level, as you mentioned, it is going to be very different and more complicated and it's made even more complicated by the nuances and complexities of the different vaccines. As you know, mm -hmm. Pfizer's requires extremely cold storage and only certain facilities can handle that. So there has to be a coordination and prioritization of where can the Pfizer vaccine go because that's gotta be prioritized based on who can handle it from a storage capacity. And then Moderna's, while it is not as uh, cold storage is still colder than, for example, what Janssen and J&J's will be. So there's this whole kind of pecking order of logistics that have to happen. And then the, the other challenge is gonna be uh, many of the vaccines are multi-dose. So how do you keep track and make sure that people understand, okay, I got the Pfizer vaccine first, and that may sound, well, you just look in the computer. It's not that easy. And so to make sure that people are getting the right vaccine in the right 21-day period or whatever, uh, just a, a logistical challenge. Sure. Certainly sounds like it. Kathy, do you have any perspective on this? Hi. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, you know, one of the things that we've really been seeing is, uh, you know, it is logistically, as John said, a true challenge. Uh, we've surveyed all of our member hospitals, and we know that we have about 40 that have the ultra cold storage that's required, for example, for the Pfizer uh, vaccine. And when we say ultra cold, we're talking about something that's being stored at greater than minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit, so just to give you a context for that. Um, but We've also been working really closely with our partners in you know, the federal and state governments, as well as working with the pharmaceutical industry to better understand and build confidence right off the bat in terms of the safety, the efficacy, the data and the science behind these vaccines. Because we recognize that the very first distribution is going to go to the healthcare workforce. And in order to build confidence, not just you know, amongst healthcare workers, but across everybody within the state, um, with, it, with the vaccines, we need our healthcare workforce to have a high uptake um, in, in terms of vaccination. And this is really, you know, a, a different time for us because, you know, um, this COVID-19 vaccine, you know, as they come out, they're going to be used under what's called an emergency use authorization from the Food and Drug Administration. So once at the FDA authorizes or approves that use of the COVID-19 vaccine, Limited quantities are going to become very quickly available because of the advanced planning that has taken place. Um, we expect we're going to see some in December and that we are going to begin work vaccinating the healthcare workforce. But we, at the same time, have to make sure that we continue to build confidence in those that are being vaccinated. As, as John suggested, you know, tracking who's being vaccinated, making sure that they get recalled so they get their second dose is also going to be important. As we look at you know, the allocation amongst the healthcare workforce, there are so many considerations. As you well know, you know we've, we've got you know, over a quarter of a million individuals engaged in the healthcare workforce just through our hospitals um, and, and the immediate continuum, post-acute continuum. And, and as we look at that, we have to worry about you know, who's at the greatest risk of acquisition of COVID. And that's gonna help drive sort of the prioritization even amongst our healthcare workforce. We're concerned about ensuring that, you know, we, when we look at the different functions that people play, um, that we're also ensuring 
that those that are just uh, that are most at risk and might not be directly within hospital units. So we're going to be looking at things like our EMTs. We're going to look at our visiting nurses, other elements, because it's not as controlled an environment for those types of individuals. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that I think you know there should be great confidence is confidence in is the infection prevention and control protocols that our hospitals have in play. That's why you know Leapfrog, for example, rates New Jersey hospitals nationally as the eighth safest in the nation. We want to continue that safety record. We want to continue to protect our staff. Um, you know that as we went through the spring surge and then we started this bounce back this fall, you know, back in early September, we had about 300 hospitalizations. Today, we're at 2,800. As we're looking at this, we need to make sure that we're protecting our staff, that we're making sure that they have the best available um, information um, so that they can make sure they can get vaccinated and that we do all we can to keep them healthy and well. Great. And Ellen, I'm, sure, I'm certain uh, from the assurance perspective, uh, you're following this also very closely. So I was curious if you had anything to add. Uh, yeah, I do. <clears throat> Excuse me, Chrissy. I'm, I was on a um, <clears throat> call last week with CMS uh, through our um, our lobbying group, AHIP. And, um, and, and so I learned a couple of things. One is uh, that the, obviously the Feds are paying for the first um, group of vaccines that hit the market uh, they have contracts with walgreens uh, walmart and cvs and um they will they will distribute in in tiers is what we were told directly from cms the first tier <clears throat> we just talked about is um frontline workers and um and and both um john and, and kathy talked about that the second tier i'm sorry within the first tier is also nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities, um, assisted living, and uh, that that channel, that distribution channel, will be from the from either CVS, Walgreens, Walmart directly to the to the nursing homes. Uh, that's the plan anyway. And then after that, it are are people who are most vulnerable uh, to the disease that uh, may have uh, pre-existing conditions, et cetera, and also folks who live in the urban areas. We've been uh, talking to the Department of Health about how we can use our our vans and some of our resources to help that distribution, uh, particularly in that that the, the most vulnerable markets, and then the general public after that. I think um, John talked about and and Kathy about the storage um, issues, and and you know right now physicians uh, don't have uh, the capability to even store the the vaccines, and they do go bad if you don't use them. Uh, so uh, that that's something that you know uh, over time will will play out. Uh, AstraZeneca that just um, announced their results and I know Johnson Johnson is, is right there as well um, but uh, so that that's what we uh, what we see the other thing is we will be waiving co-pays and deductibles uh, just like we did for testing and and visits uh, in the first wave and and that's uh, that's a requirement we would have done it anyway uh, quite frankly but um, so they'll be effectively free uh, to that population for some period of time and and the 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 cost of the drugs, uh, or the cost of the vaccine, rather, is, is very low. So that's what I would add. Great, thank you. Kathy, you had alluded a lot to the conversation about the workforce and playing, you know, obviously a critical role in getting vaccinated so that they're able to help everyone else. Um, but we also hear a lot about, you know, burnout and just making sure that our healthcare workforce, you know, from all perspectives, whether it's in pharmaceutical, uh, industry, the insurance industry, and certainly our frontline workers are, you know, okay and able to to move forward. And that is something that NJBIA has been paying particular attention to, especially as we want to make sure that a lot of our frontline workers also have, you know, career advancement opportunities and, you know, always trying to work on the workforce needs of the future. And we know that a lot of our um, frontline workers, the, the numbers are needed uh, to increase as this pandemic continues. So I just wanted to hear from all of you a little bit about what you're seeing from the workforce perspective and what are some key things that we should all be mindful of moving forward as we go into the winter and obviously into the spring. Uh, so, Percy, I, I appreciate you know, sort of the attention that you've been paying to what's happening with the workforce whether it's within the hospitals or it's other essential employees or the broader workforce who we hope remains employed as we move through this pandemic winter. 
Um, I think, you know, some of the keys for us, um, you know, on the healthcare side is really around resiliency. Um, it is really tough to gear up the way we did for the spring surge, come out of it, and now be right back where we were. By the way, last May, our numbers today in-house are the same they were in mid-May as we were coming out of the surge. And, and one of the things we're really concerned about is, you know, our clinicians and our and our team members are in the facilities working day after day, seeing an ever increasing number of patients presenting with COVID, but also presenting themselves with behavioral health needs. Um, that's really starting to uptick and flood, and that's the you know as we say that's one of the other unintended in, you know impacts or consequences of, of COVID and the sense of isolation and shutdown that's happened within the general population. So as, as we look at all of these, we know we need to take care of the mental health, the behavioral health needs. We need to worry about resiliency. We need to make sure, and you know, we're really happy that our members do this, that you know, we don't have just employee assistance programs, but we give safe spaces so that staff can decompress, they can talk about their experiences, um, that we look to stand up other things like peer-to-peer -peer, um, sessions so that there's a confidential safe space that's not necessarily directly tied to the employer so that you can decompress. Um, one mm -hmm. of the things we know is that as our workers are in the healthcare facilities, you know, providing care, whether it's the pre-acute, acute, or post-acute spaces, that when they come out after caring for people that are very critically ill with COVID and they mm -hmm. see some of the behaviors taking place in the community, that there's a sense of disbelief. And so we, what we need to make sure is that we get everyone aligned and that you know the general public helps us help them by taking those key public health steps masking distancing making sure that you're practicing good hand hygiene and respiratory hygiene we know these all matter and help to either reduce you know the viral loads that people get you know experience when they get sick with covid or prevent it so we actually need the general public to realign the way they did back in the spring mm -hmm. Alan, John, any other comments? Yeah, it's um, Alan. I, just uh, a couple quick comments on the behavioral health piece. Um, you know, you heard Kathy talk about the healthcare workers. We're seeing in our population um, a, a significant increase uh, due to COVID and in, in behavioral health uh, mm -hmm. issues. And uh, that, you know, some of that is anxiety, depression, just by people being home and not and being uh, uncertain about uh, what's going on uh, in the future. And then, um, quite frankly, PTSD and, and some of the issues that healthcare workers are, uh, are having um, and, and and they're presenting with because of because of the workload that Kathy talked about. But we did we're we doing a couple of things. One, we had launched a program uh, that uh, integrates physical health and behavioral health. So when a primary care physician sees a a patient, uh, we have the data and information we could share with that primary care physician to ensure that we get that that patient into uh, behavioral health treatment. Uh, we were able to pivot, uh, as I said earlier, we talked about telemedicine, telehealth. Uh, we did the same thing on the behavioral health side. We expanded the the telehealth services uh, throughout the state so people can get um, access to that. And then um, uh, the the uh, Two other things we were able to do is uh, provide virtual uh, telehealth uh, through telehealth virtual visits uh, for members who can't who could not get in and uh, to see a, a, a provider or um, you know were quarantined to their house. So uh, we we've uh, seen a lot of uh, success with those programs uh, as well. And then the last Kathy mentioned uh, we launched uh, our peer to peer support for our members uh, and. Um, we've uh, we've expanded that throughout the state and and we've seen a lot of uptake in that space because i would just add you know it, it, certainly we, but we have a unique in in the pharmaceutical industry we have two different workforces we have the office-based workforce which i won't get into because kathy and alan have, have gone into great detail and, and we're very similar to what the things they've done but we have the field-based sales rep representatives that call on providers and provide them with information, newest information about products and therapies and all those things. In the beginning, when everyone was in shutdown, including the physicians and, and you know the hospitals, except for treating COVID, our, we were able to, our sales reps were able to engage with providers via Zoom because they were sitting home just like the rest of us. 
and do that. But as providers started opening up their offices and treating a backlog of patients, it became difficult. They didn't have time for Zoom calls. And so we had to make a decision to say, how do we balance putting our, our sales reps back out there and maintaining mm -hmm. their safety and not putting them at risk? So we created this elaborate algorithm based on state regulations, state numbers that were monitored on a daily basis, et cetera, um, and also what what our customers, the providers wanted. Some of them, you know, did not want external folks coming in other than patients because of the, of, you know, the risk of, of contamination. Others did. So, um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. The, the irony is we rolled this elaborate thing out three weeks ago to our field and said, okay, these states are in wave two and these are in wave mm -hmm. one and these are in wave zero. And then uh, with the spike in numbers over the last couple of weeks, last week we announced that everybody's back you know, staying home because of the safety of our, you know, not only our, our employees, but also the general, general public. Yeah. Th and thanks for that, John. And I know throughout the conversation, we talked a lot about also, you know, making sure that we, we do address things such as behavioral health challenges. And we have seen increases in opiate addiction and alcohol usage and some mental health issues, some, some abuse as well. Um, all things that we were all working on prior, you know, to COVID. So, and, and we also know that there's some hesitancy, as I think Kathy alluded to, about coming into and deferring elective surgeries and some treatments. What role do you see moving forward of, like, community-based care? Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that? And will that be, you know, enhancing over, over the next year or so? Kathy, I don't know if you uh, want to kick. Or, oh, Alan, please. Yeah, no, I, I, I would, uh, I, I could start on on this. We, uh, we created even prior to COVID uh, a community health division within my division, and um, the the focus was on in the the most vulnerable communities. Um, how do we, uh, how do we engage those those members or, or patients so that we get them to the right side of care at the right time early enough? Um, we we ha actually uh, did a joint um, uh, project with uh, with Hack with um, Robert Wisconsin Barnabas, <clears throat> specifically uh, the North Beth Israel Hospital, where we identified about 2,000 of our members who who were experiencing uh, very high cost and the the health status was not good. And these were these were age cohorts which were on the younger side between 25 and 40 and and found that a lot of the issues were just um not uh, being confused by the by the the complexities of the healthcare delivery system and then not having access to basic needs uh food insecurity housing um etc and transportation so um we uh we uh, partnered with, um, as I said, Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health, as well as the community health services in those areas, um, used our analytics to identify where those people um, were, where they lived, what was what was uh, driving their health status. And then we, um, in, we um, utilized a model called the community health model, community health worker model, where we actually hired uh, people who were in the um, – uh, in the communities who knew these folks and what that allowed us to do is get much more engagement uh, early so we can get these folks to use a primary care physician for example versus the emergency room and um, they were actually uh, hired by um, Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas the health system uh, but we co-funded those uh, programs so we've now expanded that throughout the state and we've seen a uh, very you know, good um, movement in terms of not only reducing costs but improved health status from those members because we follow them throughout the process and, and and that will be i think you'll see more of that it was particularly um helpful uh, for the for those members during COVID. even though we couldn't get into the home physically we uh, we were able to do it via virtual visits and make sure that they had they knew where to go for care um uh, uh we um, we mentioned earlier. John mentioned earlier about um, prescription drugs and and the availability of of mail order and um, making those available. So so uh, those those uh, disparities in healthcare really 
were highlighted under COVID, but we had we'd started before that, and um, that's something that that I, I, we know we'll continue to do, as well as a number of the hospitals that we're working with throughout the state of New Jersey. Thanks, Alan. Kathy. So, um, you know, I, I I can't agree with Alan Moore, and um, you know, have to stress that home or community-based care it needs to occur, and um, you know, and it's critical. As critical, though, and it's not a replacement. I know Alan agrees on this because we've talked about it a lot. It's not a replacement for the acute services provided in the hospitals, um, and so we need to make sure that individuals don't put their health at risk by avoiding inpatient care if they need it, but that we use our community-based providers as an important part of that continuum of care. So, you know, you know, another way to kind of you know, view it is, um, you know, a couple, I'd say when I came on to NGHA a couple of years ago, we really took a look at what were we about as an industry. And, and hospitals, you know, it had a, a very firm spot, I'd say, in that vertically integrated space of acute care. And what you've seen is more of a horizontal integration taking place over, you know, the past few years as the commitment to addressing social determinants of health continues um, to expand. And so, you know, we've done different things. As an association, we create a vulnerable communities database ranking all of the municipalities in New Jersey by a host of criteria, about 20 different criteria that look at the social determinants as well as the health determinants, um, and then determine what's the actual vulnerability. And we know that from wealth comes health, and it plays out in the data and in the outcomes. So horizontal integration, I think, is really key. And integration continues to be a word. You've heard it, um, Alan mentioned it a little bit earlier, and you know, John actually alluded to it as well in terms of you know, how do we look to move therapeutics out and making sure that providers are in a position to look at the whole person um, and not just at a specific condition. Um, as, as we look at social determinants, I think you recall about a year and a half ago, we partnered with DCA and began supportive housing. So we know that you know, one of the very first issues confronting you know, individuals that are spiraling on the health side is the fact that the social determinant side has not been well addressed. So we know that housing insecurity is, is one of the driving issues. Um, and then as we looked at COVID Evolve, uh, back in May, uh, NJHA put out a report looking at what the disparities are in the outcomes for individuals and specifically the mortality rates um, that were driven by race and ethnicity. And that data has just become more compelling. So we've got to look at what we're doing from the community health side. We also, though, need to make sure that that doesn't become a separate new silo delivery system, but it becomes part of the integration of care. Absolutely. John, anything you wanted to add? Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you, you know, Kathy and, and Alan for really raising, you know, the health disparities and the health inequity issue because as we as everyone said, we've all been aware of those and the social determinants of health, but the combination of the pandemic disproportionately impacting those groups, mm -hmm. in, even in non health ways, because of, you know, job insecurity, food insecurity, housing insecurity, but also quite frankly, the dual pandemic that during the same time we've also as a country been dealing with a heightened awareness of racial and social injustice. So the positive to that to me is, I think given that heightened awareness and sensitivity that perhaps we can truly address on a sustainable and, and you know, substantial basis, some of the policies, and those policies aren't necessarily health policies. They are employment, housing, food policies that end up driving those social determinants of health that have a significantly disproportionate adverse impact on some of these groups. So we've made a commitment at J&J &J to our CEO, Alex Gorski. Um, you know, I've been given money on my team to uh, work with some minority groups and the HBCUs, as well as, you know, we're, we're gonna be doing a lot of research, hopefully partnering with, you know, groups like NGHA or, you know, the, um, you know, Horizon, et cetera, who has the data to look at, you know, making sure that, you know, we understand those and how do we address the policies that may, you know, drive and, and you know, accelerate those, those problems. Yeah, great, great, John. And and I appreciate the, the note of collaboration. That was a, a common theme I think I've heard from all three of you. And as we close out our discussion here uh, today, 
you know, one of the things that, yeah, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention is, you know, the, the impact to essentially the small business community, um, as well as to our largest employers throughout the state. You know, we have seen now the number of small businesses open in New Jersey down almost 23% from the beginning of the year. We know that folks are going to, and if they haven't, you know, potentially lose their health insurance coverage, as we know over 50% of our population gets their health insurance coverage through their employer. So I just wanted to see as we're, um, I'm asking for some closing thoughts, what is your main message that you would like to relay over to, to the business community? Maybe John, if you'd like to start. Sure, sure, I can start. I mean, obviously, and it, it, it summarizes a lot of, of what everyone's saying, is, is recognizing that you have to be aware of your employees' whole health, you know, psychological, physical, but also environmental in terms of, of these insecurities of food and job. Um, obviously, you know, I think it's obviously more challenging for the small businesses. They don't have the wherewithal to sustain something like this. They don't have the capital reserves that large corporations do. Um, and, you know, to have that flexibility to say, how do you and moving forward, how do you prepare for this for the next time so that you can have things in place um, to be able to deal with it better? You know, because unfortunately, you know, this is not a once every hundred years thing, I think, moving forward now. I think we're going to see more of these um, in the future and, and we need to be ready for them. Great. Kathy, do you have any yeah, comments? I, or Go ahead, Alan. <clears throat> um, no, I would just say, um, echo with uh, what John just said. I think uh, from our perspective, uh, we have a, a number of um, obviously small business, uh, mid-sized businesses and large businesses. And I think um, my message would be that uh, what has really, I think, been um, brought to the forefront in, in the pandemic is the ability for various constituents in the healthcare um, industry to work together. We have a extremely uh, tight relationship, um, uh, relationships, I should say, with health systems, with physicians, um, with Kathy and, and what she's doing, and, and obviously, um, you know, with our, with our pharmaceutical partners. The goal is to continue to provide um, services uh, and, and, and flexibility to the members we serve so that they can get affordable healthcare mm -hmm. And affordable health insurance and and we've been able to use um, our our relationships and our data and have open discussions with our um, with our health system partners around how do we how do we provide a a better uh, product suite for our for our members in the New, Jer in New Jersey residents moving forward how do we use data to do that um, and how do we effectively uh, deal with some of the most vulnerable communities as we talked about earlier. So my message would, would be, in addition to, you know, everything that Kathy said earlier about, about keeping your employees safe um, by, by wearing masks, by social distancing, et cetera, uh, would be that we are working hard in the healthcare uh, delivery system in New Jersey or with the healthcare delivery system in New Jersey to, to be able to continue to, manage the increasing costs and then deal with issues like COVID that come up uh, where we, we can um, assist our members and our employer employers by um, uh, waiving co-pays, creating more access uh, in, in removing barriers. Yeah, absolutely, okay. Thank, thanks so much, Alan, for that. And uh, Kathy, any closing remarks? You know, I would say that you know, it, our hospitals have an interesting new role in the health and well-being economically of our of the municipalities where we're located we think about the 72 uh, hospitals the acute care think about you know the entire post-acute continuum of the rehabs and the you know and 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 the long-term uh, care facilities as well and um we know that you know as we go so goes what's happening in the rest of the community so mm -hmm. we feel a really strong obligation um, you know, I think, you know, you've seen, we've done reports around the economic impact to the post-acute environment as well as the hospital environment um, that COVID has had. We've seen that, you know, purchase PPE, the cost is now 10 times what it was a year ago. So the expenses are continuing to escalate. Um, and at the same time, we've seen revenues become depressed. And yet, 
you know, our hospitals continue with this absolute commitment to their communities. They continue to provide community benefit. They continue to provide community advice. I can't tell you the number of calls that we've been on, you know, with mayors and other elected officials and with business improvement districts, just talking about what they can do to support what's happening from an economic perspective as well within their communities. And we know, and this kind of comes back to that, from wealth comes health, that as the you know, local businesses are suffering and you know, as they're forced to you know, reduce hours and reduce capacity, at the same time, it plays out for every one of their employees. And that economic burden is adding to the behavioral burden, that you know, depression and anxiety that we mentioned a lot earlier by, by Alan. So I think you know, what you've seen is that the healthcare community at large, whether you know, it's pharma or it's the insurance industry or it's the health provider industry, that we're all aligned trying to you know, move forward through this pandemic to do it expeditiously to continue resonating those key public health messages and getting us to the place where we can reopen and reopen without the fear of widespread infection. Kathy, I think you just summed it all up there. And certainly that alignment and that collaboration amongst us all and trying to, one, uh, make sure that we get the virus under control, but also, two, making sure that we have the economic you know, vitality to move forward and to bounce back. Um, we're going to have to all do it together. And for that, I just want to thank you, all three of you, for joining us today and to express our appreciation to all your frontline workers who are out there day in and day out caring for our New Jersey residents and our, you know, employees. So, so thank you again for spending time with us today and look forward to the continued collaboration on behalf of the business community with our business colleagues uh, in both the insurance uh, and, and also in the um, healthcare delivery system and pharmaceutical industries. So thank you again for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.